Hi and welcome to this video on the amino acids. So the amino acids, very bio biochemistry type topic. Um, looking at this little thing here, so it's what's called bifunctional, i.e. it contains two functional groups within it. So across here we've got our amine, so if you've just watched the amines video, there's that, you can see that, you should know that's a primary amine there. And we've got the carboxylic acid here. So it can have both acidic and basic properties, depending on which end things actually touch into. Now it doesn't normally exist like that, even in neutral conditions, because of the fact that it's got both an acidic end and a basic end, it interacts with itself to actually use those properties. So how it normally exists at a neutral pH is like that. It's what's called a Zwitter ion. What that means is it contains both a positive and a negative charge within the same compound. So obviously our negative charge here, because it's given away H plus to the basic end across here, that's received it and obviously therefore is a positive charge. Now depending on the pH of your solution, then it will look a bit different because if you've got a highly acidic solution, i.e. lots of hydrogen ions floating about, then obviously this basic end is going to pick up a hydrogen ion. But across here as well, a hydrogen ion could now stick onto our O-. minus, And what you'd get is that. So we are no longer a Zwitter ion now because as you can see we do not have both a positive and a negative charge. So the Zwitter ion is neutral. This is in an acidic pH. As you can see it's not neutral. You can also apply the same logic and determine what it would look like in a basic solution. So in a basic solution it would be like that, obviously across here we haven't gained the H plus or if we had an OH minus has come along and taken it off this end and obviously this end well gets to use its life's purpose, it gets to act as an acid and release the H plus to any base that is floating about. So that is how it would exist in a basic solution. Now one question which I particularly liked with the amino acids was comparing the boiling point of something like this and comparing it with ethanoic acid. Now it's said to do it at a neutral pH, so we'll put back up what it looks like at a neutral pH. So there, we've got back to our Zwitter iron, comparing it with ethanoic acid. Now if you think between ethanoic acid, the strongest force which is going to be keeping these together is hydrogen bonds between the actual molecules. Because obviously across here we could form a hydrogen bond and any lone pairs of different ones around it could interact with that delta positive hydrogen. So hydrogen bonds, fairly tough, but they are an intermolecular force. Not brilliant on the greater scheme of things, because if we look up here, if we've got two of these compounds floating around, So I'll not draw the full thing out. But we've got a positive and negative charge. So we can have some electrostatic attraction between those oppositely charged ions. Now when you've got a full positive attracted to a full negative, that's an ionic, well, an ionic combination. So the attraction between those is huge. So the melting or boiling point would both be much higher than this compound here. So ionic interaction, tops the hydrogen bond interaction that would have with itself. Um, you do need to be able to name some of the simpler amino acids, not the biological sense in terms of the alanine, glycine, lysine, etc. I cannot remember all of them. I doubt any biologist does. Well, some biologist probably watching this has. Um, but you need to give, be able to give them their proper chemical names. So screw all those words proper chemistry names. Alright, so if I change it back to that, just for ease. 
So we start at your carboxylic group. Your carboxylic tops everything. So effectively one, two, three. There is our longest chain. So we've got a propanoic acid and we've also got an amine here. So where is the amine stuck? It's stuck on carbon two. So two amino. So two amino propanoic acid. Um, if you've looked in your textbook, some of them do have quite complex structures. So as I said, you would just be required to name the simpler ones like that. You can have it as well where you are asked to sort of draw what happens when these link together. So it does come in, tie in a bit with the, the next topic, the polymerization. And that what can happen is you can form a peptide bond. Now a peptide bond is just another word for what we'll see effectively. We're going to perform a condensation polymerization. And what we will form is an amide bond actually linking them. So effectively you'd have a polyamide. So. So if I bring two of the same amino acid next to each other here, what can happen? We can remove water there. So condensation doesn't always mean removal of water. It's just removal of a small molecule. It's usually water. So I would just draw the linkage between those now. So there is two of them linked together. So this is effectively, um, it's not a, a polymer because obviously a polymer extends off. If I wanted to show a polymer, what I would do is just remove one of the H's there, have a trailing bond, and likewise remove this OH and have a trailing bond off there. And that's how the polymer would look. But this is two of the amino acids stuck together. And as I said, we formed an amide bond. So there is our amide linkage. The carbon double bonded to an oxygen, so a carbonyl attached to a nitrogen on the same one. So that is an amide link there. Now, uh, one thing to mention, if you had your um, polyamide or even sort of the two of them linked together there, if you wanted to get back to your original monomers, your old amino acids, you can just do hydrolysis. So just six molar HCl, lots of water, and obviously the water just cracks open the bond and you get back to your compound up here. So six molar HCl, water, hydrolysis, obviously hydrolysis using water to break bonds. Now the amino acids form that tend to get into long chains. When they get into long chains, they become just known as proteins. What holds the actual proteins together is the hydrogen bond. So there's two ways you can actually look at them. Either helical, as you can see like that, spun round with the hydrogen bond between the loops there. Or what's known as pleated, so where you've got more or less straight lines with them holding it together there. So just hydrogen bonds between them. It accounts for sort of some of the properties of things like wool. In effect, the hydrogen bond there, I can stretch wool a little bit and it'll ping back as long as I haven't really ripped apart and broken those hydrogen bonds. So that's why if you heat the temperature of wool up too much, supply too much energy there, they break apart and then the wool will lose its shape. And the helical structure and obviously all of this tying in with the proteins is quite important to look at enzymes with that. So an enzyme, it's just a biological catalyst, so it speeds up reactions. Now enzymes use the lock and key method, i.e. they've got a very specific hole with an active site in there, so only a very specific compound will actually fit in. So they are highly selective. Now because of that, if you change the temperature or the pH and start messing with these hydrogen bonds, 
and distort the shape even a little bit then it utterly loses its function so here this will just flop in and straight out it doesn't get the chance to actually well for the enzyme to actually perform its role so you need to be quite careful with temperature and pH with your enzymes as, as I said highly specific so they lose their actual shape if you alter those properties too much uh, that's it for amino acids short biochemistry style topic